Wow, it's almost like it was planned, huh? How's everybody doing today? Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, there's a lot of things going on today around town and right here at Archie's. Um, we have a few announcements that we want to make, and I'm looking for his Pastor Bob. There he is. Bob's out greeting. Um, you know what? I'm just thinking there must have been an awful lot of June weddings because we have so many birthdays today. <laughs> yeah, I did the math. I'm, we have, we have uh, Karen, one of our wait staff. Where are you, Karen? She's not. She's inside. Karen's birthday was yesterday, actually. So when you see Karen, tell her happy birthday from yesterday. Um, Susie at our prayer table. It's her birthday, I think, tomorrow. Shiloh, one of our young girls that sings with the kids praise, it's her birthday today. Jackie Thomas's birthday is today. I'm not sure if she's here today or not. Kathy Saunders, who's out in the truck out there, go swarm the truck and tell her happy birthday. She's out there because they have an unruly child from Labrador, black Labrador. <laughs> and uh, she's out there in her car. So we just want to sing happy birthday. You guys want to sing happy birthday with me? No? Okay, then we won't. Without, we don't need any music. We're just, because we're professionals. Just remain, don't try this at home. I'll, while they're doing that, let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll do the happy birthday. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another great day. We thank you for keeping us safe through the week. God, I thank you for the privilege of sharing your word and your truths with so many. God, that you've, you just keep feeding me, God. And because I know that I'm fed and I know that I'm okay, I can begin, I can just begin to start to love others and share your truth with others. And God, um, we ask you to just administer truth today. Ask you to feed the ones that are hungry in the spirit and in their soul, that you would show them your love and your guidance and your patience and your grace and your mercy. We say this in Jesus' name and we ask it. Amen. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear everybody, happy birthday to you. Maybe it's not your birthday today, but it's somebody's birthday somewhere. Um, we have a lot going on, but uh, we started our new Alpha series on Wednesday nights over at 101 Seaway, upstairs from Captain Bob's Subs. That's me teaching that class, Wednesdays. And then Pastor Bob does a Monday night class called Grace, the Forbidden Gospel. It's on the front of your bulletin. There is no bad time to jump into any of these classes. It, if you're in Chapter 1 or if we're in Chapter 8, it doesn't matter. It's a good time to join a class and, and learn. So I know Bob's uh, continually teaching his, and that's a long study. Mine, uh, the Alpha Series goes for nine weeks. Then we're going to take a movie night break and then go into what we call the Relational Empowerment Series. So that's our plan for the teaching. Uh, we have all kinds of support groups. If you look at the back of your bulletin, and if you look at the inside, that's your homework for today. You don't have to fill it in, but I find that people often do, and they leave it on their end table or their coffee table or hanging on their fridge and get reminded through the week what God spoke. So let's open up with uh, our, one of our favorite songs. This is what we do here. We gather at Archie's. This is not in your songbook. Check. She's gonna get down on her knees. We'll give the thanks to Jesus cause it's seen all our needs. We're gonna gather here at Archie Sundays and lift the Lord on high. Well, it might seem the deck is full, but there's always room for more. Just squeeze it and introduce yourself cause all his friends are yours. We're gonna gather here at Archie Sundays and lift the Lord on high. Shabby, or you don't think 
You might know that song from way back. If you do, keep the words to yourself. We rewrote it. <laughs> <laughs> this one's on page 47 in your songbook. Yeah. 
waiting on the drummer. We're going to slow it down a little bit and bring it back to, I guess, was, was this from the 40s, maybe, this song? 50s? I don't know. You'll, you tell me if you know. some songs that aren't in your book we've got to update our books once we build our new playlist it's gonna happen so this one's not in there and I warned a couple people here about backing away from the speakers <laughs> every night I say a prayer in the hope that there's a heaven Every day I'm more confused As the saints turn into sinners All the heroes and legends I knew as a child Have fallen to idols of play And I feel this empty place inside So afraid that I've lost my faith Show me the way
Who would have thought one of those rock and roll songs from my high school era would work in church, right? Sticks, that was a group called Sticks back in the 70s and 80s, and boy, they were one of my favorite bands because each of their songs told a story, and actually that one really spoke to me when I saw it again as a, as a 50-year-old man looking back. Show me the way, God. Show me, show me what you want. What a difference when we turn our life over to him and say, show me what you want to do. God, take this mess, wash away all the fears and the illusions, and show me how you want me to live. That's where life begins as Christians. Miss Wendy's going to take all the kids way out front. She has a, a special deal going on for, why is everybody in green? I look around and I see a sea of green. We've all gone green. Good, good. So Wendy's going to take all the kids out front, and I want all the leftovers. <laughs> uh Interesting, though, because we're, uh, with this song, it came to the forefront about the same time we were starting to do a service uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, which is really Jesus speaking from his heart and saying things like, you know, it was written that you shouldn't do this, but I'm going to tell you what that really means. I'm going to show you the depth of allowing my spirit lead in your life. And he, see, because he was here in the flesh, he hadn't sent the other helper yet to live in us and guide us. He was here, he was here with a limited audience at the time. Uh, I believe there were 12 that were around him pretty regularly, and then he spoke to masses pretty often. But the 12 who were around him pretty regularly were the ones who I believe that song speaks to. Show me the way. Show me what you want. I do believe you're the Son of God. Show me how you want us to live. And that's where life began for them. In their flesh, they got freaked out. Because at some point, he said, I'm done. After about three years, he says, I got to go, guys. And they freaked out. But the good news is that what he told us was what I'm discovering. The other helper, one just like him, came to live and guide, to live in me. So I want you to be reminded because it's a really great, um, it's interesting. I did this at the jail the other day, too. But where is God? And so many people, oh, he's everywhere. God is everywhere. But specifically for you, God put another helper to live in you and guide you. God is here. And wherever you go, he's never leaving you. He's there. If you make a mistake, he hasn't left you. Maybe you're not communicating with him, but he's there. He said he put his spirit in you. It's the day that you said, God, I'm yours. I need your help. I want your guidance. And I've done that about 18 years ago, but, but it's our very natural tendency to take control again, isn't it? To go, I don't need this. I got, I got this one, God. You might understand everything, but you don't understand my marriage. You don't understand my finances. You, yeah, but my car. You don't possibly know about cars, do you, God? And what I find is the more I hold on to those things, the more frustrated I get in life. And I've got to go back and say, okay, God, show me how you want to do this. And I don't believe I stand alone in that. Matter of fact, I know Pastor Bob does the same thing. I've heard some testimony on his behalf. So Pastor Bob's going to come up here this morning. He's going to talk to you about <coughs> Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to talk about that four-letter word, love. Good morning. And, and Dave just hit on it a moment ago, a moment or two ago. He said it's about what God's will is in our in our life what is god's will and uh i had the opportunity to attend a fellowship yesterday out at freedom ranch and uh we did some shooting out on the cow pasture and had a good time but um john glenn talked to us uh at the beginning and what he was talking about was the same thing he said people ask me all the time you know should i do this should i do that he said I only know what God's telling me to do. You need to go listen to God and hear what he's telling you to do. And what he's telling you to do might be different in your life. There'll be some commonality in principle, but we're each individuals, aren't we? We each have our own personal relationship. And if we will take time out of the busyness, the rush, the hectic rat race of life, and take time for what's important, spend a little time with your Savior, 
you'll start to listen, you'll start to hear that, wow, he really is talking to us. And, and John pointed out something that really struck me because it was a symbolic thing in Revelations, I believe, and I never really understood it. And he said, he talked about the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth, the word. It's the word. And what is? We've talked about what is the word of God. Well, word is an expression of thought and intent. So what is the intent of God? It takes us right back. We need to hear. We need to listen to what God's telling us. And when we can trust that still small voice and that persistence thing that he's put on your heart, when we're finally willing to step up to it and say, okay, God, I'm going to set my will aside. I want your will. That's when change starts to happen. That's when change really starts to happen. But like Dave said, when we say, hey, I got it, that, that, a red flag should go up right then. Imagine a big red flag. A friend of mine, Tom Edwards, is a counselor, and he talks about when you get to a certain emotional level, you, he pictures this big red flag, and that's one as counselors that we have, this red flag is when people say, I, I got this, or similar words that mean, no, no, I'm in control. I got, I'm okay. Over, you know, you start to get to a, a subject that's a little dear to their heart and they don't want to deal with. And then all of a sudden it's, I got this. And those are alarm words or buzzwords. Wait a minute. Who's got this? See, if I've got this, then where is the room for God? We have control issues, don't we? We don't like to yield we don't like to submit. It's against our fleshly nature. But when we're willing to lay it down and let God be in charge, great things happen. Real change occurs, and we start experiencing that peace that Jesus talks so much about. Now, he starts chapter 7. This is a continuation of his sermon, but it's going right to the heart of the matter. He's hitting us right between the eyes. In verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. Judge not. What's he talking about? Judge not. Well, we tend to be judgmental, don't we? We tend, see, 85% of our talk, our communication is self-talk, where we're silently talking to ourselves. Well, a few of us may be out loud, but mostly we do have the script running in our mind, and we're making judgments and assumptions all the time. And I don't need to go with that assume word. We know what happens there. But judgment's the same thing. I, you know, I have to be honest. I'll take, a, you know, a fourth and fifth step here and, and tell you that when I was on the long, boring ride to work every day, carpooling with my good friend Bill Planer, uh, it was about a 50-minute ride in the morning down to Martin County where I worked from Fort Pierce because, you know, whether you took the scenic Indian River Drive longer route or US-1, it's stop and go, stop and go. The time was the same. It's going to take you 50 minutes in rush hour traffic to get there. And Bill wasn't the fastest driver in the world. But every morning down in Port St. Lucie, this little black car with little roof rack would go flying by. And this tall guy sitting there, and he had this long beard. And every time I'd see him pass us, many, many a morning, and I turned to Bill a time or two, I said, that guy's probably a terrorist. Another time I said, he looks like a jihadist to me. Well, two years go by, and I'm up at the uh, Indian River County Range, and I'm one of the few guys that shoots the old smoke poles, the old flintlock rifles, and there's another guy there that's shooting muzzleloaders. So we get to talking. And then he looked the part like a buckskinner. He had the long, thick beard. They got to know him, and we started getting together and going to some shoots on some private lands, and we became friends. We started hunting together. We've been up to North Florida on some trips. And this good friend of mine now, Jerry, who is a deacon at a Catholic church and a youth minister, um, he's that guy. It hit me one day when he pulled up to my house on a trip when we were going to take my car, and I, I saw that car. I said, dude, you didn't used to drive down US-1 at about 7.35 in the morning between Walton and Port St. Lucie Boulevard. He says, yeah, that's when he was going to school to, you know, becoming the church was sending him to a school down south. So I, 
judgments, we can be very wrong on first impressions, can't we? And is it possible that we just build from that on this foundation of judgmentalism to a lot of things that just aren't true? Is it possible? Maybe other things that we think and assume aren't based in truth? Well, Paul writes about this too in Romans. He said in chapter 14, verse 10, but why do you judge your brother? For why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Contempt. See, we go from judgment, we make an assumption, a bad assumption usually, right? And then we start to form this opinion that goes a little deeper. And that's where the real judgmentalism comes in, that critical attitude. And it's easy to see it in other people. I mean, I can tell you other people that I've been with that, you know, will launch out with criticisms about people they don't even know just from the way they drive or who they see. But I do the same thing. We all do that. If you get honest about it, and Christ himself is warning us why is he warning us because it's destructive we're not what was it that he told us to do love one another by this they will know that you are mine love one another where's the love in that criticism where's the love in that judgmentalism we haven't walked in somebody else's shoes there's many other times the same thing. I've met somebody, and I had formed an opinion, and then as I got to know them or maybe just know about them secondhand, they were totally different than what I thought. What did I base all that on? My own opinion, my own assumption. He goes on further down in chapter 14. He says, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. So who are we talking about when we're talking with God? God's not going to say, hey, tell me about Sally's life. Tell me what John over there was doing. Uh, -uh. It's not what it's going to be about. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. We're not to be a stumbling block. Now, I can remember stumbling blocks that got kind of thrown in my When I, you know, was wrestling with God about, you know, I'm time to stop drinking, you know. Okay, I'll just go smoke pot instead. And then it was like God's like, nah, that's not really the, the road I have for you. And it's like hanging around the same people. Oh, come on. Come on, man. You're funny when you get high. You're, you're funny when you get stoned. People would try to keep you trapped in the lifestyle that they're in. That's where listening to God comes in. Are we going to listen to everybody around us, each and every person other than God himself? Or are we going to listen to God? Well, I can tell you, listening to God has brought me a lot more peace than listening to other people. That being said, once we are listening to God and we're on the same page with him more or less, he will put other people in your life that are good, that are positive when we're willing to submit to him. And he will give us affirmation through people. He does work through people. But recognize in ourselves when we become a stumbling block, maybe by offering too much criticism instead of a helping hand. That can be a stumbling block for somebody else. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. I won't even get into gossip, except to say gossip isn't edifying anybody. Talking about somebody behind their back to, you know, get other people, bring them into your judgmentalism, that's not edification. That's not building up the body of Christ, the believers. It's not bringing other people into belief. It's not offering anything that's good and lovely and pure. That's being a stumbling block.
And Jesus said, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? It's graphic language once again. My wife, Wendy, was building these uh, flower beds, and she used my vehicle to go buy these long, rounded kind of four-by-four four log things. And uh, I came out and asked her if she needed help unload, and she already had them unloaded and was already sawing them going to town. But the little bit I was involved, I'll tell you, a plank is a big piece of wood. Jesus is saying it's not that, you know, your little specks interfering with helping somebody else. He said it's the big, obvious problem in your life that everybody sees but you. Get that resolved. Deal with that issue. And then maybe I can use you in somebody else's life. But the motivation when he uses us won't be to, oh, let me go be do-gooder and let everybody see how I'm helping somebody. It will be authentic. It will be motivated out of that inner joy and love and peace that he puts in us. And I've shared it before, but it seems very appropriate. When I first started teaching Alpha Series years ago at Safe Harbor, probably five or six years ago, and I was pleasantly surprised because I'd never taught anything that John Hales or John Glenn didn't come sit in the class to see if I taught it okay. One of them told me, and John Hales said, it'll teach itself. The gospel does. Something to that effect. And he was right. And John Glenn told me, he said, you're just a beggar that found the bread. Now you're sharing the bread. That's the motivation of humility. That's what I think and I'm not judging, but just an observation, the little bit I've heard uh, about the new pope. He seems to have that humility. He says the focus is Christ, and he's right. The focus needs to be Christ. And when we focus on Christ, we start seeing Christ in other people, even when their behavior isn't about Christ, even if they're confused an infantile Christian that doesn't understand who their father is yet, doesn't understand their identity, but we can love them with the love of Christ because every person on earth, every single one is either your brother or sister in Christ, but what if they're not saved? Or your potential brother or sister in Christ. Maybe if we look at people that way, we open up the channel for God to flow through us so that we can minister his love to other people. How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and then turn and tear you to pieces. I never really understood that years ago when I used to read that. And what I believe that it means now is that there are people that aren't ready for Christ yet. There are people that have turned off to God for whatever reason. Maybe they were treated legalistically. Maybe they were condemned. Maybe they ran into cliques when they tried to join a church. I've seen that. And they didn't experience any of God's love there, and they think that's God. But there are people that will spit in your face, and you will offer kindness. Offer. We can't make them take it. God has to turn the light on. We can offer it, but if they aren't going to accept it, we don't have to stay bogged down in some codependent enablement that only furthers their dysfunction by becoming a floor mat and opening our wallet and giving them everything so they can keep running the wrong way and doing the wrong things, and we just help them do that. No, don't go there. Offer them the truth with love, but let it be an intelligent, God-given love. And some people God will say walk away from. It's not for us to get involved with. We don't condemn them. We don't say, that's your last chance. 
We offer the truth in love, and if they won't accept it, move on, because it, it's really their salvation is up to God, and God's will that's everybody is going to get saved. That's his will. He offers it, but he doesn't force it, and we're not to force it either. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Don't give up on prayer. But I will say this. Are you asking God what he wants? Or you just continue asking him for something he's already said no to? Sometimes it's not yes or no, but it's a question of timing. And we want it now. We want it right now, instantly, or at least by tomorrow morning. And God doesn't always work that way. There are periods of time, and, and life changes, and he grows us and develops us. And over time, we may look back and see, wow, I've asked for some stupid things. I've asked for some things that didn't line up with his word at all. And I tra treated God like a genie. Well, God, you know, you can just make it happen. You know, there's no way it's not really biblical or anything. But you can just finagle it. Well, maybe God didn't want to finagle it because he knew it would be damaging to you and possibly other people. God gives us what we need. We read that last week. But it ain't always what we want. But over time, we will see that the very desires in our heart, what we want will change, and it will line up with God's will, and that peace will come pouring into our life. All right. Good job, Bob. As always, uh, you're taking up more and more time every Sunday, though. So I think uh, next week I might just go away for the day and <laughs> let Bob do it. Um, I... I always sit over here and I listen to, to Bob's rendition of the study and then I take some notes and, um, boy, isn't it, uh, isn't it something how, we, how quick we are to jump on someone else's troubles and make a judgment? And I, I actually saw something this morning on Facebook and it was an elderly man sitting on a bench and he just looked to be pretty much down and out and the, the title of that picture next to it said, let's stop judging and start helping we don't know where this guy has been what he's been through and what it took to get there and when we start to look at our own lives I was one of those too that um, you know how foolish my dad was and what a jerk he could be sometimes that's what we do in our head and then I look at my life and I get real about me and say boy I'm I can be a jerk too sometimes and it's because, and I like, we like to blame it on what happened when we were a kid or what happened as we were growing up or what so-and-so did to us and how we got wounded and how we adjusted our lives to never let that happen again. So we shut doors and, and we leave people out who really might make a big difference in our life. And I went through this leadership training that was, that was huge for me. And it was, it brought me beyond myself and started to get me to consider what is it that my dad had to endure that made him who he was? What possibly occurred in his childhood that wounded him so badly that that's all he could do was to survive the way he knew how? And that changes a whole different perspective about looking at your dad or your mom or your attacker or your abuser or your spouse or your children what is it that's been going on in their lives? And um, I, I don't even remember what movie it was, but, oh, I was watching this video that Bob gave me about, it was, uh, hey, guys. <laughs> See, now, a couple years ago, I would have hit one of them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I would have I at least yelled. <laughs> Hey, what are you doing up here? Don't you realize this is my spot? <laughs> I was watching this movie, uh, this video. It was about counseling, and, and it was. It was talking. It was getting your little kid 
get in your little get into your little child inside that's been wounded and wishing that you could you know have that joy of your childhood again how many people don't wish to have those times you know and one of the segments was about it just hit me like like a ton of bricks so what are you doing over there and this guy was doing this role play with himself as a little child well i'm building a fort you know oh really is it a clubhouse yeah it's a clubhouse well who's who's in the club oh all these cool people you know my best friend billy and you know it's my clubhouse and it brought me back to this time in my childhood where we used to build snow forts and stuff. And, you know, the woman haters, he-man woman haters club, you know, you girls aren't allowed. But it was so much fun to be in control and to feel that safety and security and how life changes over time. Love. Loving people is something that kids do until they get wounded. And then they pull back in fear. And... Maybe you're a little child still pulling back. I don't know. Maybe you got to this denial thing. Maybe your plank is pretending it didn't ever happen. And that's a hard place to be. But he talked about getting honest and looking at our own stuff. And it's not easy. It's not going to be easy. The scripture that talks about if your hand offends you, cut it off. It goes on and it says if your eye is offensive to you, pluck it out. It's not literally talking about cutting off a physical limb or taking out a physical object. It's talking about dealing with your wounds. It's going to be painful, but it's going to be helpful. Let's get them out. Let's bring them to the light. So let's jumble through this real quick, and I've got some other things I want to speak on. But since God is love, and Jesus instructed us to love, I'm filling in your blanks for you here on your study sheet. Then why do we spend so much time criticizing, blaming, and judging? And the answer, I'll give it to you, this not on your sheet. The answer is because we're human. Because we're made up of this flesh that says, I don't need God, and I don't want his ways. I got this. I'm in control. And as long as I'm in control and I'm right, then I can feel okay about me regardless of what other people think. That's called your ego. Your ego, trying to keep you safe and alive. And I'll make a judgment about you because if it keeps you off at a distance, then I can be safe. Not you particularly, Larry. <laughs> Just the pen went there, sorry. <laughs> so we've got to look at that. Why do we do what we do? There it goes back to motive again that we spoke of a few weeks ago. It's often so much easier to point out the faults in others and of other people than it is to look at our own stuff. Every day, every week, God reveals faults of mine to me. If we allow him to, it's not that he's trying to beat you up. He's trying to build you up. He's not trying to push you down with your faults. He's trying to show you the error of your ways don't take it as punishment. Don't take it as you're not good enough. Take it as God isn't done yet. He's not done yet with you. I think the quote from last week was, you know, in the end, everything is going to be wonderful. And if it's not wonderful, it's okay because it's not the end yet. That goes along with a quote that my wife used to use on me when I first met her because I was very so much more judge judgmental. And she said, why do you do that? Even God is going to wait till I'm dead before he judges me. He's going to look at the whole picture, not what's going on right now. And the good news about that is when we get judged then, the, slate, the slate's already wiped clean because of what Jesus did. It was forgiven. It was forgiven. The only reason I get into heaven is because it was forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, for that. That's the only ticket I got is it was forgiven long time ago it isn't the words that we say that speak so loudly it's our attitudes and actions is anybody one of those ones who don't say much verbally but boy they speak with their face or their body is that you or maybe it's you and you don't know it maybe that's a denial you have <laughs> how about that one i always love those you know when you walk by somebody and you get this <laughs> 
what was that? But here, check this out. We can't just blame others. Because guess what? This is what Mark and I talked of this morning. If you've taken, if you've been agitated by somebody and you've taken an offense by a ch, and you didn't really know what it meant, that's yours. That offense is yours. That agitation is yours. Own it. Find out why. I know why ch bothers me. I know why hearing you're wrong bothers me. Because as a kid, that's how arguments all ended. All of them. I was the youngest in my family. I had two older brothers. Had my dad. And arguments always ended, you're wrong. And the door would slam, either figurative, figuratively or literally. And the argument was over. And you don't have the right to speak your mind. So when somebody tells me I'm wrong, the bristles go up. When somebody does <laughs> It's because much of my life I heard as your opinion doesn't count. Pff, you're nothing. Pff, really? How could you be so dumb? But you want to know what? All those thoughts are mine. And see, when I was a little child, I dealt with those childish things and I played with those toys. But God's called me to grow up. And he says, it's time to put those things of my childhood away. Here's how it was put in the leadership seminar. Why are you believing a lie that you made up at five years old 45 years later? Why do you choose to live on that lie that you made up that you're no good when you were five when it's not true? It's not true about any of us. That's why I choose to look at God's word. I choose to see what he says about me. I am his beloved child in whom he is well pleased. Yes, I make mistakes. No, I'm not less than. Yes, I feel alone and scared like a little boy sometimes. No, I'm not alone. I'm never alone. God is there with me all the time. Yes, I feel rejected by other people. No, I'm not rejected. I'm fully acceptable to him. He tells me so every day. I need to know this every day, just like you do. That's the importance of our teaching. That's the importance of finding truth. I can tell you this. I've been in a lot of churches, even as a pastor, who doesn't necessarily dress like one, who doesn't necessarily have the hairstyle of one, who doesn't necessarily have the vernacular of one, even as a pastor and strolled in and had people look at me sideways, speak to me sideways, and talk down about me in front of me and behind my back. And I want to tell you something. Spiritual maturity doesn't come from sitting in church for 25 years and attending. Spiritual maturity comes from being led of God and growing up and being matured by his spirit. There's lots and lots and lots of people in the church who refuse to grow up because they got it already. And they will judge you and condemn you, as will I sometimes, because I'm still fallible. But I'm asking God for help with it. And that's the key. It's your attitudes and your actions. When we begin to get honest about our own stuff, God will come in and he will conduct a thorough house cleaning. He will go into your warehouse and he'll say, you know that stuff you've been hiding that you think isn't bothering you? It's killing you. And it's time to take care of it. It's killing you. It's killing your relationships. It's killing your friendships. It's killing you physically. You've got ulcers over stuff you've worried about since you're eight. Let's throw it out. You've got problems with your family, with your spouse, with your children, with your parents that you've been holding on to since you were this big. Let's get it out of the way. Let's deal with it. Jesus promised us that he would hear our prayers. Our prayers will be heard and they will be answered. I want to be like my dad, finally. My dad in heaven. I want to be like him. I desire to grow up to become just like my dad. And that's awesome. And you can too. The golden rule, treat others the way you would like to be treated. The only way that's going to happen is when you know that you're safe. 
that you're secure enough to speak to them out of love instead of anger, out of love instead of judgment. It's the only way it's going to happen. If you fear being retaliated against, you won't communicate. We just went through it. Let's, me and Mark, exposure right here. We both had these little things that were in our craw about each other. You know what? Instead of talking to each other, we played it over and over in our minds. We talked to maybe some other people about it. Well, what do you think? You know? Instead of going to each other and saying, man, this hurt me. I was wounded. And he's, he, him and me and me and him. It's like, you know what? I was scared too. But what were you afraid of? I was afraid my best friend would go away. That's what happens with our wives and husbands. I was afraid I would lose my best friend. I didn't want to tell you the truth because I lived in fear of rejection. When what you really needed to make it more intimate was to get honest and communicate with love and say, I was afraid. The only reason I had to lie was fear. And I didn't want to lie. I want it to be better, not worse. And yet the very thing I try to do in my own strength, hear that one, in my own strength, not in God's strength, was to deceive and manipulate a situation that I really wanted to be honest. And we do it, and we do it, and we do it. That's one of those little cl clues that you're still saying to yourself, I got this, just like I do, because we're flesh. But God said he wants to work out our relationships with others, doesn't he? He wants it to work. He wants not uniformity. He doesn't want us all dressed the same in the church, all have the same suit and the same tie and the same hat and the same haircut. He wants unity, relationship, intimacy with one another. And he starts with our intimacy with him. And from there, he grows it in our relationships. But until you know you're safe and secure in God, you're not going to be able to find safety and security in your other relationships. It's a necessity. The Alpha series that we teach on, on Wednesdays and the, God's, uh, the forbidden gospel that's taught on Mondays, the reason we go over and over and over and over and over those things is because our flesh naturally wants to go back to, I got this. And we need more and more and more. I teach it because I need it. I teach it because it, it impacts me. And I hope that other people come along and follow God that way too. Listen for God. Do what God's telling you to do. And you'll be doing so much better in your life. Stop getting to the attitude without seeing the flag that rises up. I got this. Because the, the, really, the reality is you don't. God is in control. And you don't have it. You might have a small section of it, or at least think you do, but it's time to give up. Throw the flag and give up. Father, we come to you this morning, and we just ask you to touch our hearts. We ask you to reveal to us the planks that we don't even see. God, I've got so many planks in my life, I could build another deck. <laughs> Maybe an ark. God, I ask you to show me my planks. I ask you to take those planks away. I ask you to, I ask you to heal my heart. I ask you to show me compassion for those that I don't understand. God, I ask you to reveal to me when it's my stuff that you want to deal with. Maybe my discomfort is because I don't like hearing the truth. But God, I'm asking for truth. I want your truth. I want to make things better in my life, not worse. God, today I come to you. I toss my hat into the ring. And I say, take me, God, today. I'm asking for more. I might have been attendance. I might have been playing God, playing church. But God, today, I want to be what you call me to be. I want to be like my dad. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As, as we go in, uh, Miss V is in the back there. Don't look for Cat and Doug today. They're missing. Um, but V's back there, and she's going to serve communion this morning. And while we're doing communion I don't normally do this, but we've got a couple really beautiful songs while you're lining up for communion. If we could, let's just kind of do it silently and listen to the words of these songs. The girls are going to start with one, and then we're going to have another. And then, of course, we will close out with one of our rock and roll ensembles.
Enjoy this with us.
it up a notch, will you, maestro? <laughs>
to the breeze. All right. Hey, thanks everybody for coming out. It feels like we're going to have some stormy weather, but God will get you through. No worries. It's not going to rain till Tuesday. That's the name of a band, isn't it? Till Tuesday. Hey, there's one we can do. I'm walking on sunshine. All right. Everybody have a great week. God bless you. Be safe out there for St. Patty's Day, and uh, God bless all of you.